Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairperson, um, Chair, Chairman, uh, Professor Köchler, for your kind introduction. And uh, I'm, I sincerely appreciate the fact that you also pointed out that actually I served in two cabinets uh, since I came into office as an independent expert minister. And that's also why I continued in the in the in this expert cabinet because uh, this was uh, explicitly omitted by many uh, in the media. Uh, I was never elected, I never joined a party, and I have never had to maximize votes, which is a big difference when you simply can do your um, your solution seeking without thinking about the domestic political home front, which is the case for elected politicians, which I have never been, and uh, I simply returned back to my academic work. Uh, which I can now exercise with several Russian academic institutions since I had not any contract after 2019. And that's also why I quitted Austria in 2020 due to the prohibition to work both in academia or to do any other professional activity within uh, inside the European Union that I had to understand. And uh, so I quitted uh, the European Union altogether. And I'm very grateful that I can do my teaching and my research and publications uh, east of Vienna. <laughs> Let's put it like that. Yeah. So um, uh, the topic that we discussed uh, with director Mark Donfried is uh, what has happened to diplomacy since this was also the major question I asked in the book I published uh, with Olms in Germany in June 2020. And uh, the book is all about craft and art of diplomacy. And I would like to focus here also on the aspect of craft because uh, diplomacy, like any other profession, consists of a sound basis of uh, um, of craft that you have to master in order to reach the level of art. Um, and uh, that starts with recruiting the right people, talented people who have uh, the capacity to conduct a conversation, who master well languages and who, key, who remain uh, curious in their mindset and respectful in their daily professional behavior. Um, Diplomacy has been suffering for decades when I compare uh, the level of conversation and above all, the amount of time that we dedicated to each other uh, during uh, visits on the foreign minister level, on the state uh, president level, back in the 1980s when I joined as a junior diplomat to the Austrian Federal Ministry, when I compare uh, the habits, the practice, of uh, those years uh, to when I joined the ministry again as a minister in December 2017, I was stunned at the, I was, I was irritated, intrigued by the absence of time and also the way conversations are done. Uh, instead of entering into a true exchange of opinions, listening to each other, we have returned over the last decades, unfortunately, to uh, to telling each other what to do. Uh, you can also call it transformative diplomacy, as is the notion that has been used in the uh, North American world in particular. I Let me remind you here of a, a speech that uh, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice did, uh, I think it was back in 2005 or six at Georgetown. I, uh, I wrote a paper then about her speech. And uh, this is nothing new. Uh, it was actually already Thomas Jefferson when he served as envoy of the still very young United States in Paris prior to the French Revolution in 1789. Uh, he, in his memoirs, actually writes about the need to change, about the need to, he didn't use the notion transform, but about change. Uh, um, change the way uh, international relations, diplomatic ties are handled. And uh, there's a fundamental difference between what diplomacy theoretically should be about and how the practice was for centuries and to what has happened to diplomacy over the last few decades, namely uh, from non-interference in domestic affairs. Of course, on a footnote, we can say there always was uh, uh, a, a slight line into interfering here and there. 
to to plant interference in domestic affairs and uh, to telling others what to do. So the the art of conversation has uh, uh, unfortunately gone down, and we see more uh, uh, talking about each other than a real speaking with each other. Uh, and this was my my first. Uh, astonishment uh, and I, I saw it in particular with deep regret I must say with profound regret in the council meetings uh, where we are 27 ministers around the table absence of attention everybody busy with his mobile phone this is a general problem that people do not focus anymore on what they are listening to or supposed to listen to uh, and uh, a true political dialogue it's impossible, of course, with 27 uh, protagonists around the table, uh, but it has become a bit technocratic. It has become uh, all about lines to take, repeating positions, and there's little difference between what is discussed in public, what is uh, presented in a press conference after a 20 or 30 minute meeting, and what is really done behind closed doors. Uh, so the absence of discretion, the absence of confidence, and uh, the underinvestment, if I may put it like that in a kind of a, a business term, in trust building uh, is, um, uh, is, is deplorable. Uh, so um, when I published my book on diplomacy in June 2020 in Hildesheim, Germany, uh, I was already aware of the huge dilemma in which uh, diplomatic craft is, not to speak about the notion of art. Uh, what happened in uh, between, let's say, December 2021 and mid-February 2022, prior to the Russian invasion into Iraq, into, into Ukraine, prior to the starting of a fully-fledged war, and I've always called it a war from the very first day on, um, is that um, there was no real diplomacy happening. There were 20, 30 minutes meeting. Uh, maybe some of you remember the press conference between the then uh, uh, British uh, Foreign Minister Liz Truss and uh, her Russian colleague Sergei Lavrov. Uh, Lavrov in the press conference then said, uh, Mrs. Truss is speaking in tweets. And uh, this was, a, in a nutshell, uh, the description of, of the dilemma. There was no trust. Uh, it was, it was everything was known. It was a, a presentation of tweets. Uh, and this has, this is a far cry away from what diplomacy should be about. So as, as, as also Professor Köchler has stated in, in some of his interviews, I had the pleasure to read, um, that war could have been avoided Definitely, if there had been genuine diplomacy. So this is message number one. Uh, message number two, where do we stand in today's uh, horror dilemma in the, in the war theater in terms of tanks, not talks, while some people say, no, please, we need more, more talks. Uh, let me remind you also here of the statement of uh, the Turkish uh, Foreign Minister Mevlu Çavuşoglu, and I'm very grateful also to Professor Köchler having mentioned my initiative with regard to, to Turkey. I'm still in good contact and exchange with Mevlu Çavuşoglu. Uh, I was supposed to be in three weeks in Antalya for the Diplomacy Forum, which they unfortunately had to postpone given the, the human tragedy. That's, that's certain that this has priority. Mevlu Çavuşoglu was among those mediators who actually last year in Antalya, when we had the second diplomacy forum, did his utmost to ensure a ceasefire and a beginning of facilitating a dialogue between Kiev and Moscow. Uh, it was sabotaged, if I may put it like that. Mevlu Çavuşoglu then said also a few la days later, unfortunately, there are countries inside NATO, there are countries inside the EU, I, if I correctly recall, but he definitely said NATO, which are against these talks, which are which are undermining our efforts. Um, Chavoshoglu said it last year, uh, Naftali Bennett, the former Israeli prime minister who was also involved as a mediator, has revealed it to a larger public also a few weeks ago. 
so yes, there were efforts, um, not if you want by those who you would consider as the traditional mediators, be it the Swiss, be it the Norwegians, be it the Austrians, who traditionally played a certain role. Uh, neutrality has transformed also itself through political action and uh, some uh, traditional mediators have deprived themselves of the role as facilitators and mediators, unfortunately. And interestingly enough, we have uh, states, governments, which uh, uh, are uh, like Turkey, Turkey, a member of a military alliance such as NATO, Turkey being the second largest and the second most important member of NATO, uh, or also Hungary as a NATO member, which are much more active in mediating and bridging than the the de, de jure neutral countries such as Switzerland and Austria, which is interesting, but also uh, regrettable. Uh, and um, so diplomacy is popping up here and there, but uh, what is lacking in the current situation and what was lacking also a year ago is trust and time. And if you want to break down diplomacy to a mathematical formula, which I sometimes do. You don't have to write a 400 page book as I did. Harold Nicholson in 1939 uh, wrote a much slimmer book and it's still very well lit. I say it's, it's simply called diplomacy. And uh, Nicholson and any other, and I myself, we, we all subscribe to this mathematical formula. It's diplomacy equals res uh, remaining on speaking terms in all circumstances. That's what it is about. And that's what adult people should be doing. Unfortunately, we are in an era, our contemporary practitioners of diplomacy have become highly emotional. I also said already as a minister back in 2018, yeah. uh, I serve a teenager mentality among my peers west of Vienna. And if I want to meet adults, I meet them among my Indian, Chinese, uh, Pakistani, Russian colleagues, but not so much among my other colleagues. And uh, this is a pity because it's uh, diplomacy is not about emotion. Uh, Talleyrand, who was a master of his uh, craft uh, and who represented France after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, he uh, coined this phrase a diplomat never should get angry. He should simply take notes. And uh, so take out your emotions, try to converge interests, and you will never fully agree on certain topics. That was also the case uh, between Ankara and myself representing Vienna. There were many open files, but remain on speaking terms, take up the speaking terms again, create some chemistry in the room, and uh, for that, you need people with, with a certain sense also of uh, how to create an atmosphere, how to, how to build trust. I'm coming back to this. To, 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 I'm repeating myself with the trust building and taking time. And uh, for that, recruitment, education, training in that sense uh, should also focus on other topics than what I have I've been observing in various diplomatic academies where I've been teaching over more than 20 years, whether it was Vienna or, or anywhere else. Uh, I had the pleasure to teach uh, future young colleagues. Uh, and uh, to be a talented diplomat, and unfortunately we have a lot of untalented people in, in ministries of foreign affairs all over the globe. But in order to be a talented one, and for each and every profession, you need talent. It's not only about the education and the learning. You should have a good mix of what Harold Nicholson called the common sense. Harold Nicholson warned against uh, lawyers uh, being diplomats or missionaries. It was all about common sense. It was all about a good sense also of curiosity, human kindness, interest, always remaining interested in the host country, respect for the host country, uh, not wishing to transform them not wishing to tell them off what to do, how to treat whatever in their country. But uh, so if I may say exactly the opposite of what is happening today when it comes to the predominance of public diplomacy. 
uh, which uh, is in my eyes exactly the, the opposite of what genuine diplomacy should be about, classical diplomacy. And we are certainly in a dire need for good old classical diplomacy, trust building, non-interference in uh, domestic affairs, and putting yourself for at least a few hours into the shoes of the other side in order to understand. You cannot teach negotiation skills as it is done from Harvard to Beijing in a, in a weekend. This is impossible. It requires practice. It requires experience. It requires a huge, profound knowledge of the culture of the other. And speaking a language does not always mean that you really have understood the culture. It's about the poetry, the literature, the music. Uh, your host country uh, lives through and 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 uh, and thereby putting yourself into the shoes of, of the other. So um, let me finish on that. Uh, I've already uh, used my 15 minutes of, of time. Um, recruiting, regaining a good uh, level of craft of diplomacy in order to reach the high level of art which means being in a position to solve very, very deep dilemmas. And uh, there's most probably not a topic uh, more tragic. Uh, let me put it like that. It's simply a human tragedy uh, from A to Z, what's going on uh, in terms of the military and other confrontation between Russia and Ukraine on the one hand, but also between the 42 countries which are implementing a huge sanction scheme and the rest of the world, which is a big rest, uh, the other 150 countries. So uh, in order to, to, to start from here, I'm looking forward to your questions, comments, and uh, let's enter the debate. Thank you very much for having given me this opportunity to join you. Many thanks, Dr. Kneisel, for sharing with us your experience in diplomacy and uh, in uh, also uh, steering the diplomacy of the Republic of Austria into the direction which you described, namely uh, to accept the principle that uh, a diplomat is not there to teach the other a lesson, but to engage in dialogue, and that a diplomat should always be also uh, driven, so to speak, by intellectual curiosity, interest in the culture and politics of the country he or she is dealing with. And that is exactly also the credo, so to speak, of the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy and our, our academy here in Berlin. There will be many questions, particularly related to the application of uh, your, um, so to speak, analysis of what democracy, what uh, diplomacy is meant to be to the present uh, situation of conflict here in the European continent. I think what is needed now is an approach that is uh, going beyond uh, uncontrolled emotions that is rational and that is aimed at uh, negotiations. And what I think is very important is that you emphasized on the basis of your experience also the principle of non-interference into the internal affairs of other states. By the way, this is one of the main articles in uh, Kant's uh, seminal treaty on perpetual peace, zum ewigen Frieden. One of the basic, Kant described this in a brilliant way as one of the basic conditions for peaceful relations among uh, sovereign states. I would have myself many questions also as an Austrian, how a country that is permanently neutral should handle uh, the uh, situation now and should act diplomatically concerning the conflict. But 
I will first uh, invite the audience to ask the question to ask questions. So let me just see who is who would like to ask a question. There is one from Germany and one from uh, Ukraine. Please. Um, so I, I'm Lisa. And can you please? Uh, can each of the speakers introduce himself or herself first, please? Um, I'm Gabi Kuz. Uh, I lived a long time in Turkey. I'm also a Turkish citizen. I have not been in Turkey for six years because I don't want to go to prison. So this is a personal start. As an academician, I love balance. I love science and I love facts. So um, especially to my students, I try to teach them to like, unravel the hypocrisy and also to look if something is genuine or instrumental use. So when I hear you talk about Mevlet, Mevlet Davutoglu, I'm getting sick because he's, in my opinion, he's a fascist and the Turkish government is using the conflict not in order to secure peace, but the instrumental use is to, in order to like gain momentum and look better on the international stage. There has been um, bombings in off Syria from Assad and Erdogan in the last week in the earthquake area. And um, this is a big humanitarian catastrophe. There's proven evidence that the military didn't go to help people. Tens of thousands of people died because there was no humanitarian help coming. Although Turkey has one of the biggest militaries with 450,000 active personnel. So, I have to say, I have huge trouble um, with what you said, because um, yes, we have to talk to everybody, but at the same time, we have to be careful that uh, diplomacy is not used as a stage to like simply, um, simply, and yet like simply look better on the international sphere. And particularly when we talk about NATO, yes, this is exactly where I would criticize NATO and be on the other side of this NATO is it problematic. NATO is problematic also because of Turkey inside. So this is actually where we can say it's hypocrite to, um, to criticize Putin, which we should, but then not criticize mm -hmm. Erdogan. So, um, so actually I have like a totally different experience from you. And also academically, I have um, a totally different evaluation of what is happening. I don't think there's good actors there. We have, I'm more of a realist and say there's power politics at play and Turkey is one of the big players using the stage now. So not a, not so much a question, more a comment on your talk. Uh, please, Dr. Neisel, if you would like to uh, comment on that. I think uh, the lady stated in the very first sentence that what I said had made her sick, so I take note of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, please, the next uh, speaker is uh, the lady from Ukraine. And if you could briefly introduce yourself also. Um, I grew up in Ukraine and I have lived in the US for the past 20 years. And um, coming from the world of arts and culture, I actually am a big proponent for diplomacy. So I appreciate this conversation. And the question uh, that I have for you is, um, do you think that all of this diplomacy that you mentioned, which is a wonderful thought, uh, should have been exercised and focused on after the brutal invasion of Chechnya or Georgia in 2010, or most relevant in 2014, when the international law of order had been brutally broken, and um, the Western leaders had eight years to make sure that this uh, war doesn't happen and prevent this war. Uh, thank you very much for um, yeah. Thank you very much. My question: Do you think that diplomacy failed then? And if yes, why do you think and why do you believe it would work now? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for your question. Diplomacy definitely failed when we look at the Minsk agreements, Minsk 1 and Minsk 2 of 2014, uh, which was negotiated uh, in spring in the aftermath of the Maidan events, uh, Crimean crisis. Uh, and uh, we had in June 2014 in the so-called Normandy format uh, upon a French initiative, the meeting uh, uh, 
between the Ukrainian Russian representatives and Germany and France as mediators. Uh, that was the diplomatic basis of, from 2014 to beginning of 2022 to solve the issue. And it was all about uh, uh, rebuilding sort of Again, to that, but security guarantee Russians and not only Russian speaking, also Hungarian speaking um, uh, peoples in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, so, let me answer your question on the failure of Minsk 1 2 because as a minister, I, I, I was part of this frame of the phrase parts of it, or when I spoke to the OSCE monitors of that mission to, 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 to solve the issue in Eastern Ukraine, and it was all about language use, minority rights, all the topics that, uh, that were on the agenda of Minsk. Uh, let me answer the question by the following. Uh, former Chancellor Angela Merkel said in an interview with Die Zeit, uh, I think about two months ago, it was sometimes in December, if I correctly recall, she said Minsk was all about gaining time for Kiev. And uh, that statement uh, uh, was quite a surprise to the Russians. Uh, and let me answer or, or continue on that note with a uh, statement by former European Commissioner and former German Minister of Economy and Finance, Günther Verheugen, who said a few days ago in another interview, that he was deeply astonished, I think even shocked by that statement by his former colleague Angela Merkel, because he said, and I completely converge with him on that statement, that by stating maybe the obvious, I have no idea, but it was quite a shock for the Russian audience mm -hmm. that Minsk, in which so mm -hmm. many efforts were put into, diplomatic efforts and so on, there was never a serious political will to well into a solution. It was more a kind of ritual than a real fact-finding and a real solving of the, of the fundamental issues. So yes, uh, in retrospect, we have to see, to say, and, and Angela Merkel gave us, so to say, the key to that revelation, uh, there was a failure. There was a failure ever since 2014. And that was that's also what it was perceived by, by many others without knowing now the larger context. And uh, and Günther Verheugen, and I, I will conclude on that with, with quoting him, is that by, by revealing uh, that it was all about gaining time, it was not about solving. Uh, the European Union, and in particular Germany and France, have put themselves out of any mediation of any talks uh, between Minsk a bit between uh, sorry between Kiev and Moscow for the long term may I ask you Dr. Kneisel uh, two questions uh, one is related to your uh, term of office as a foreign minister of Austria and the second one is related to what you say the, to, about diplomacy in general. I don't know if you can or if it is proper for you to answer the first question. Uh, related to the Ukraine uh, situation, which you, on which you spoke about just now, in uh, those years when uh, you were foreign minister, the issue of the Minsk II so-called package of measures, which in a way, by the way, always reminds me of our Süd Tirol paket, which solved the problem between Italy and Austria over Tirol. Um, at that time, <clears throat> the issue was whether this uh, package of measures about it autonomy and the federal system and so on would eventually be implemented, as was agreed upon in 2015 in Minsk. And I do remember when there were presidential elections in Ukraine, uh, uh, which uh, were uh, won by uh, Mr. Zelensky, in the, during the electoral uh, campaign, one of the candidates, who was a very powerful uh, member of the uh, government uh, in Ukraine, came also to Vienna. And I asked him why 
these implementations of uh, federalism and autonomy and so on for the eastern Russian regions are not uh, be why no steps are being taken by Ukraine. And his reply was immediately, it will never be considered in any way because that would lead to the disintegration of the country. So he made it very clear that they never considered uh, to take any of those measures. Uh, and I wonder if that was uh, anyhow an issue for the diplomacy of a neutral country such as Austria. At, at the time when you were foreign minister, Austria was still neutral. Now it is not neutral on whether Austria has done anything, also on the basis of its own experience concerning South Tyrol and concerning our package of measures, our South Tyrol package, has done anything uh, to try to convince the Ukrainians to go along this way. And um, the second question is how one should really uh, evaluate this uh, these documents that were presented by the Russian Federation towards the end of 2021. One was a draft treaty, which uh, Russia presented to the United States and to NATO. When I read the English version line by line, my impression was that this was some kind of an, uh, the, the initiative was some kind of an ultimatum which Russia issued vis-a-vis -vis the West. And here I would ask whether this was the proper procedure in terms of the diplomatic approach, which you described to us. These would be my questions. Mm -hmm. was Thank you very much, Professor Köchler. Yeah, uh, let me brief, I, I, I'm, I'm full in position to, to respond. We have a problem now with the connection. We ca we do not get the sound. I don't know if you can hear uh, now. We do not get the sound from your side. I, I, can, I can hear you. It's a bit interrupted. Uh, it's a bit interrupted. Can you hear me now? Is it yeah, fine? Now, now we can hear you. Hear me? At the moment, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I will. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Kochla. I, I can really well respond to both questions mm -hmm. regarding Minsk and the position of uh, the then Kiev government under President Poroshenko. Uh, uh, let me put it like that: there were efforts by the Austrian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, to offer, let's call it consultancy, uh, technical advice on neutrality, and you mentioned the Cyril uh, package, which uh, which is uh, often quoted, but one also has to bear in mind the limits of analogy, and they are there. Uh, Ukraine is a huge country uh, with, uh, with, with, with a much more complicated issue than Cyril ever was. Um, but there were efforts to discuss it. And I think there was also a sincere interest uh, by the Ukrainian side, at least by certain officials in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on a, on a, on a technical level uh, to engage in something like that. But um, I was told, I was not present in these meetings, but I was then by, by one of my advisors that fortunately uh, there was also action inside Kiev to not prolong that. So and these efforts did not inside Kiev, but they were coming from the outside. Uh, so uh, the Ukrainian officials were not fully free in their radios uh, to, to discuss such issues. But there was technical lies and there was an interest in the concept of neutrality. This is number one. When it comes to the to what you mentioned in terms of the risk of a disintegration of the country, if uh, if Minsk too have been implemented, as you quoted this Ukrainian official, um, my experience by talking to OSCE officials in particular uh, to, to 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 our diplomatic staff, which was involved with that file, uh, I often had the impression we are repeating in a ritual a topic uh, about which we knew much too little on the ground, despite the OSCE mission. And as, as Karin Kneisel, as a human being also in all that, 
my first and foremost priority, I tried to advance among all the other topics, how to ease daily life for people living in Eastern Ukraine. It was about queuing up at the offices of, of, of the postal services to have access to their pension payment, for instance, social transfers and so on. It, it was about easing their life because we, we are speaking here about a, a, a group of society, old and, and, uh, um, and, and, and not in full health, uh, who had to queue up under under sometimes terrible daily circumstances, weather wise, uh, administrative wise, how to have access, for instance, to their pension payments, or to have access to to, to the bank account as such. So it was all about uh, easing their life, making daily life a bit easier for them. And at the same time, I would say we did not really know what was going on. In, in, inside Eastern Ukraine. And uh, the politicians who had been dealing with the topic back in June 2014, when the Normandy format was created, President Hollande uh, had been replaced uh, by President Macron. Angela Merkel was still there, but um, I don't think that, as she has also revealed in her interview, uh, she, she was really eager or, or, or kept people asking to please implement it because as she said it was all about gaining time and that gaining time in order to to to, to get the, the the ukrainian armed forces on a certain level so that's that's the quote of angela merkel and that i would say it was quite a shock to the to the russian officials uh when i was here in december in moscow to teach my courses i was um I, I, I observed the debate, it was inside the university, on the media, but there was no debate at all in Germany on that topic, which, which, is, um, which is a shame. Um, regarding the Russian document that was advanced, if I correctly recall, also in an uh, ad hoc urgency meeting, sometimes between Christmas and New Year's at, in December 2021, um, and it's, I think it was it was submitted because I followed it really on a day-to-day -day basis on the 18th of, of December 2021. And then there were the, the OEC meetings in Vienna called Urgent uh, just after Christmas. Uh, that was considered an ultimatum. It was like, uh, if you want uh, the, 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 the last call, if this is not happening, then something might happen. And that happened then. So uh, the, the tone, the mutual tone had already become a freezing one, but all that didn't start in the end of 2021. The problems didn't start uh, in early 2022. It was an accumulation on all sides. And uh, it unfortunately has led us uh, into a tremendous, dangerous situation, which we are now facing on the European continent and going beyond that. So uh, thanks instead of talks. Thank you. Unfortunately, we I'm told we have now exhausted our time according to the schedule for this morning. I thank uh, Dr. Kneisel sincerely again for uh, having shared with us uh, her experience. And I just can hope that uh, international diplomacy in the um, uh, centers of power, so to speak, will again be given a chance according to the maxims and principles which you have so convincingly and perfectly outlined to us. And I would like to wish you all the best for your work as uh, a, in the field of uh, international relations. Thank you so much, Dr. Knessler. Thank you very much, Professor Michelin. It was a pleasure being under your challenge.